Hi, welcome to Exploring the Illusion of Free Will. My name is George Ortega. I'm here with my co-host, Stanel. Stanel, good to see you again. Pleasure is all mine. Okay. <laughs> and this is show number 88. Okay, and this the title of this show is Unfree Will is Driven by Hardwired Drives. What I mean by hardwired drives is we're programmed this way biologically, genetically, and that's why we don't have a free will. Before we get into the theme, and now let's, let's first go through what people mean when they say they have a free will and basically why it's completely impossible. People who believe in free will are basically saying they can make choices independent of all their genetics and all their conditioning, which is totally incoherent and makes no sense. The other argument for free will is I could have, in my past, when I made that choice, I could have acted otherwise. Again, totally incoherent and impossible. Okay, and the third argument that like sometimes... Many arguments, but those two the major ones. Yeah. Right, they, they change the, the meaning of the, of the term free will because then they say, well, it was my choice, I did it, so that means I have free will. Now let's start refuting them. So like basically when they say that I have a free will, that, that I did whatever I did, I chose it, the, the answer to that is that the reason why free will is impossible is because everything has a cause. Wait, we're not refuting choices. I, I got to get into this because we do our live show. Uh, you're probably watching us on Eminem. We do the live show every other week. We get calls every week. I make choices. Explain to them what the, why this is not the, the... We're not refuting... Of course, pe people make choices. They're just not free choices. So let's not hear anymore... You know, I make choices, so I have free will, so refute that, please. That's very important. All right, a lot of people say, of course I have a free will. I make choices all the time. It's like Anel just said, this isn't about, like, you know, whether It's not the illusion of choices. We know we make choices. Right. And you, you want to know something? Let's, let's refute this on a more fundamental level. First, we don't make choices that are free of reasons, free of causes, okay? And secondly, think about this. If... If there's a chain of cause and effect, because that's what's affecting everything, that's like, you know, if we make a choice, then there's a cause to that, and if everything has a cause, there's going to be a cause to that, and there's going to be a cause to that. These causes go back into the past. Think about this now. If, like, something that's happening before we're born is making us choose, quote-unquote choose, whatever we choose, it's actually not even our choice. Right. You know, so most technically, we really don't even I make I agree choices. that things happen before we're born affect us, but I'm not that, like, you know... If we didn't sell Manhattan to the Dutch, we'd be speaking Dutch, for example. But, yeah. like, in our lifetime, I'm just concerned, like, you know, we can go back before we were born, but what's the point? Let's just stick with our lifetime, you know, that we don't have free will. But I know what you mean, yeah. Right. All right, so, so basically, you know, the idea is that um, the belief in free will is that we would be able to choose that our choices are ours, that we're making the choices and it's completely up to us and we're overriding anything that we're not in control of. Again, control is the key. But when you consider that, like, causality, the chain of cause and effect goes back to before we were born, the fact that we have an unconscious that takes part in every and a decision. subconscious, yeah. Subconscious. All these things that we're not in control of, we're not in control of our heredity, we're not in control of our environment. If these things are impacting or actually, like, making us who we are, then that's a clear way to see how why free will is impossible. Now, this whole show is actually going to be about why explaining how we actually have hardwired genetic drives, like instincts, like, like many of the lower animals. And so, like, if every decision that we're making is based, even in part, on these instincts, then that's not free. Because, like, for example, for example, if I were to say that I was freely holding th these papers in my right hand, okay, that's one meaning, right? But all of a sudden, when my left hand is holding them also, I can no longer say that my right hand is, is holding them alone, right? Because both. So the, the reason I say that is because, like, if we have part of us that's our conscious mind who thinks that it's choosing, and, but the unconscious is our left hand, and it thinks it's, it's taking part in that decision, that's another way to understand that, no, we don't even have a partial free will. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. So let's go. Let's go through this. Let's start with like the basic drive. This is known in psychology as the pleasure principle. Freud. So this is evidence that makes free will impossible. Exactly. Okay. Go ahead. So the first one is that we are hardwired, compelled. We can't but seek pleasure and avoid pain. This is what we. This is our our a very fundamental drive that we all have. What about people who like sadomasochism? They love to. They, they seek. Pain. Good point, good point. With a sadomasochist, okay, that's what gives them pain. I mean, pleasure. pleasure. In other words, yeah, exactly. They derive pleasure from pain. And there's another one. What about, you could say, what about people who, like, who run marathons? You know, who, like, you know, 
I mean, marathons are grueling. They're in pain. These people, they, um, they derive more pleasure from achieving that, from like, from enduring that pain and surviving than from avoiding. And what about a martyr who blows himself up in a crowded market in Iraq to, you know, a martyr with a cause? Right, That's exactly. pain. What are they doing? Right. Again, they're, they're basically... 72 virgins? I mean, the, the, yeah, the afterlife they thing? They feel they're going to be rewarded in heaven. So still, killing yourself for a cause is still more pleasure than pain. Exactly. And how about like those of us who will spend like hours and, and days and years studying, working really hard for a goal in the future? We'll, we'll choose to put ourselves in pain. Why are we doing that? We're predicting that overall, our pain is going to lead to more overall pleasure in the future. Right. Yes, yes, yes. So the drive to seek pleasure and avoid pain makes free will impossible because you have no choice but to do that. Right, and think about that. Any decision we make has this component. We're going to be... It's totally instinctual. It's not learned. I mean, the drive to seek pleasure is, is there from birth. Think about it. Yeah, yeah okay. from, from birth. I mean, like this is something, you know, a baby cries when they need, uh, when they want um, milk or whatever they, they want. You know, it's completely instinctual. And again, when we're making any decision, any decision we make um, has to have that, in, that um, component. That's like the first component. Is it to my advantage either in the future or, in, or immediately to, to choose this? Or is it going to like be a disadvantage? You know, so we weigh these. And so, all right, so that's one, that's one very, very powerful drive that's in our every decision. Here's another drive. We, the Greeks understood this. Anytime we do anything, at the time we're doing it, we think it's the right thing to do. Now, looking back on it, we may say, well, maybe it wasn't the right thing to do, but the time we're doing it, that we have a moral imperative. So the 9-11 terrorists thought that was the right thing to do in their own crazy minds. Exactly. Right. Just, well, think about, George, right. think about George Washington. George Washington was a terrorist. He was a revolutionary. If, if we would have lost, if he would have lost that war, he would have gone down in history as like a criminal, you know, because the, the English crown would have written the history. So mm. like, so yeah, whatever we do, and again, a lot of times in hindsight, we'll say, all right, Gene, you know, if I knew then what I know now, I realize it was wrong. But you know, the time we're doing anything, we're hardwired to really do what we consider right. And a lot of times, it's not just like about us. Like, for example, like society might think that a certain thing is wrong or, or right. And we might consider, you know what I'm saying? Like, it, it, it's about the person. All right. The next thing, um, and these are drives. These are hardwired. Another one is like, we've got a drive to be reasonable, to, to make sense. How, how would you I look at it? that as a drive to do what we feel is fair. Absolutely. You have no choice but to be fair. And everyone has a different idea what fair means, but f that's where there's conflict. If, so if you don't believe in free will, there's still going to be conflict. Right. You're never going to, I mean, I know you don't like to think that no, way. No, but no, no, absolutely not. You're gonna... The blame won't be malicious and evil blame. It'll just be like, well, for practical, conventional, useful reasons and practical reasons, I have to, and pragmatic, I have to blame you. But we all deep down know you're not ultimately and fundamentally to blame. Right. Okay, now another another. So it's fair for me to sue you because you stole my business or whatever. I don't know. Right. So so fairness is kind of it's, it's what's reasonable. It's also what's moral, right? You know, it's fairness is kind of like morality. Well, thing. everybody has a different idea of what's... And morality is kind of... Uh, I mean, like on a sinking ship like Titanic, a lot of men dressed up as women to get on the lifeboats. In deteriorating circumstances, morality changes very quickly. I mean, you know, what would you do? Perfect example. No, that's... So it's a man-made thing. In some countries, morality... I mean, but everyone has their own version of what morality means. It's causal. Right, and, and we're going to get into this because, like, it's not just the pleasure uh, imperative drive, the morality drive. Morality changes by situation is what I'm trying to tell. Like, in a concentration camp, I might have to kill someone to get out. I mean, I don't know. No, no, you're the perfect example. So I like, may not kill normally. Right, because we, we not only have the moral drive that's compelling us, we have the survival instinct. So it's whichever is greater exactly. at that moment. So if you're on the Titanic and you absolutely will, don't think it's right to ever dress up as a woman, you would have died. But for me, I value living more than cheating and that's so i would dress up as a woman get the hell out of there i don't know what you would do <laughs> but i'm saying yeah i see what you're saying right the greater desire rules the moment 
Yes. That's very interesting. That's the thing. That's different for each person based on causality. Exactly. So, like, you've got these competing drives. So it's not just one drive. It's not pleasure. It's not just morality. Competing drives. It's also drives. survival instinct. And uh, these are working on, on every decision. You know, that's it's a perfect way to understand. But not everyone has a survival thing as number one because I know about this... Uh, this Buddhist monk who lit himself on fire as to sh pr prove an example. So his greatest desire was to show that he could, you know, stay calm while he's burning to death. I think there's a video of it. I've, you've, you've mentioned this, and oh, I've heard yeah. other people. Yeah. And other people commit suicide, so their drive is not survival. It's to get out of pain, right. which would be number uh, one. Right, and then a lot of times it's all unconditioning. If you're a Buddhist monk and you're taught that, like, if you do a great act of self-sacrifice... You'll get nirvana. Exactly, then that's going to be a, a motivation. Yeah, so while you're burning to death, you could tell yourself, this is part of the plan, I'm going to go to nirvana, this pain is great, but I'm just watching it, I'm zen, you know, it hurts, but I can get over it. Yeah, right, it depends what you're telling yourself. Exactly. Which is totally causal. Exactly. And not freely will your, what you tell yourself. Sorry, Albert Ellis. <laughs> Sorry. No, it's true. It's, it's also true. What you like, tell yourself. We're conditioned. You, these, a lot of these drives are conditioned. In other words, we are hardwired to be moral, but the morality that we're hardwired to do isn't yeah, really For example, up to us. I called an old friend of mine just yesterday, an old girlfriend yesterday who made me better, feel happier. I didn't have that thought available to me last week. I just wasn't at that moment of causality. So. You cannot just will things that aren't meant for you earlier than they should be. It's it's very fascinating. Oh yeah, oh yeah. That thought is in the future. Where's the thought before it became a thought? It's not you know. Exactly. The and causality then, wasn't there. Right, and think about it. You you know you thought it was a good thing to do. You, it would. It, it seems positive. Like if you had a free will, you would have done it last week or right. A month felt ago. better last week. Two, exactly. Three months, years ago, whatever. I right. Broke that, up, yeah. that applies oh, to everything with the moral principle, with the hedonic principle. There's a timing thing to it. Yeah. Yeah, because like think about it. With this pleasure principle, or again, we all seek pleasure, avoid pain. We're not all blissed out, you know. We, we, you know, if we had a free will, based on this imperative, this hardwired drive to seek pleasure and avoid pain, we would never have unpleasant feelings. We would, we would be blissed out every moment of every day. That's a very powerful reason why, you know, free will is impossible. All right. Before we go forward, there's millions of that million, but it's like. 50 good reasons why free will is impossible. Today's show seems to be about more the secondary reasons because the main reasons, you know, are cause, things are either causal or random. I just want to review causal or random, the subconscious, the unconscious. Things can never be 50 50. So we're doing some like uh, deeper down work today. These are like the, 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 yeah. I mean, we came up with like 50 reasons why free will is impossible. This is in the bottom 25. Yeah. If you've been watching us every week, We've discussed the main reasons enough. And yeah, yeah, right? The, so yeah, we're because, gonna, yeah. Yeah, because also this one is unique because, like, in other words, when you're in sixth grade and eighth grade in science, they teach you that, that animal behavior, human behavior is a product of nature and nurture. Nature being the genes, nurture being the environment. This show is about um, nature, our heredity, you know, what we're hardwired by birth to do, our instincts. Right. You know, so in other words, like this, this stuff is, these drives are taking part in our every decision. Now, what's very curious, think about this, in school, whether it's elementary school, junior high school, high school, college, they'll teach that our human behavior is a result of nature and nurture. There used to be like a debate whether it was nature or nurture. Now they understand it's both. But you got to understand, they never say in science, nature, nurture, or free will. Even if it's a all nature or all nurture or a combination, say there's two circles, right? Even if you overlap them, the human being is nowhere in the in the hot spot of free will. I mean, it's either you're a mixture of nature and nurture, or the nature and nurture are separate. But either way, that neither prove free will. So where's free will in this? Exactly, and that's like where is it? I don't understand. It's no right because it's like nowhere. It's totally incoherent. And so like in science and school, they ignore this. They ignore this contradiction. They teach kids that like. This magical spot of I'm on the spot for free will, it just, it, it's nowhere to be found. Yeah, I know, I know. And, and, and it, again, like, it's easiest to understand it through causality, but if you understand that we all have basic drives that we're not in control of, we don't decide, they're completely genetic, they're handed down from our parents and their parents and all, that's a good Right, way. so you, no one's ultimately responsible. So if you had a messed up life and you're miserable or whatever, you can blame your parents, right? Because you have your nature and your nurture, but your parents raised you a certain way, they can blame their parents. And then you dig up your grandparents from the grave, and, and well, if you're old enough, you have your, and dig up your great grandparents, and they'll come out of the grave and blame their parents. Who, there's, there's no, the buck doesn't stop anywhere. And that's good, because like that, the idea behind that is like, so we don't, we don't have any reason to blame ourselves anymore, because we're completely innocent. 
but the good thing is, so are our parents are right. You can blame innocent. your parents, but don't blame their parents. And each, I mean, it's just so. So I mean, like Jesus Christ came to Earth to like to to give everyone forgiveness, to forgive their sins and stuff. This is a way to forgive yeah. everyone's sins. Nobody is like you know blameworthy for anything. Blame Nobody, the situation. Absolutely. Or the causality. That's how big this is. Like blame the entirety of the universe, because that's really what's behind every decision. The entirety of the universe. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. All right. So, like, we've got another. We went through this a bit. Uh, well, no, this is another one. The procreative drive. Don't we have a drive to, like, perpetuate our species? You know, that's why we get married. That's why we do all that stuff. Well, some people don't want children. They've conditioned out of it. That's true. You're saying a drive from birth. Right. But I'm, I wonder if any newborn baby doesn't have that drive. It could be genetic. I don't know. Maybe they didn't get the gene. I don't know. My understanding is... Nine, nine, like, 99% of the time, you probably have the, ge- the gene to want to procreate right and also an urge yeah i think it's also like for example when as we go in through adolescence you've got these hormones in in both the men and the women you know like the testosterone the estrogen and all at that age you know that's what like that's what's driving their behavior you know that's what what it's about so like that's another you know not everybody has that no 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 not everyone has and so in a lot of times it's societal all right so we've got we've gone through like the pleasure, pleasure, pain, morality, the reason imperative. I want to go back to the the reason drive. Let's say you've got mm-hmm. a picture of that's water. my main that's my main drive actually. Right, because like I reason, always want to do what I perceive as fair. No, but this this but is but what I just, feel is fair is what you know, not what I other people think is all fair. All right, but think about this not just in terms of fairness, but in terms of smart. What's intelligent? You've got a picture of water. There's two glasses on the table. One of them looks like it's going to hold all the water in the pitcher. The other one doesn't. It, we, we're going to do what we always think is going to make the more sense. Right? We can't, we can't do that. If we, if we think that one whole glass is not going to hold the water, we're not going to try to pour the water in it because we, we're hardwired to do what we think is always going to make sense. Okay. I like to look at it as reasonable as what's always fair. The, even in, no, without free will, I still think there'll be conflict in our world because everyone has a different idea of what fair is. So when they go and f- clash, you'll have to battle it out, but you won't really be blaming the person. You'll just know that this is how life is and I have no choice but to fight you because I need to get what I think is fair. The other person will say the same thing, but nobody's going to be condemning you as crazy or stigmatize you as evil for getting what you feel is fair. We'll just say this is how life is. It's competitive. Right. So let, let's say, and yet, so there will be that level of competition for available resources. We have no right? choice but to be competitive for finite resources. Right. So then, so right. then, how does it change? What happens is, like, under the free will perspective, not only are we competing for the, re- the resources, but we're saying, well, the other person's wrong. They deserve to suffer. They deserve to. to, to be no, the other for- person also has no choice but to compete for finite resources. Right. So, you're going to go into battle without blaming each other. In That's a way. the thing. That's the thing. It just so, has to be done. It is what it is. Exactly. Total acceptance of reality. So, like, we have finite resources. Two of us want it. You know, there's a little bit of food. We're on this deserted island. I want the food. You have a survival instinct. One of us is going to, you know, I have to fight you for it. Right. But I'm not going to blame you for fighting me. I'll say it's just the way the world is. Right. And, and in terms of evolution, before our civilization, when we had competing wants and stuff, we had clubs and weapons and stuff. We went at each other, right? So what happened? The next stage in evolution was we became civilized. We started to, like, sue each other. Negotiate. And to, like, talk it out. Right. That's, that's a better way, I think. Right. Yeah. So now we're at a stage now where, like, we, we'll talk it out and we'll sue and stuff, but at a higher stage. In other words, it'll be without the blame, without the acrimony, without the negativity. Right. But again, yeah, it, it's important that, that, you know... When you our, attribute free will to someone, you really create much more animosity because it's like they're doing something deliberately. You yeah. know, they intend to hurt you. They're trying to hurt you. They have free will. But if without free will, their pain that they're causing you is not intentional. They just don't know any better. They're acting within their nature and nurture... They don't really mean to hurt you, you know? Right. So the intent is gone. And, and less about, acrimony. Yeah, because our, our reason... Our, less resentment, less hate. I agree, yeah. Right, and our reason, our reason, our drive to be reasonable is based on our beliefs to a certain extent. In other words, like, if we believe that we and everyone else has a free will, it's going to be reasonable to kind of, like, blame someone and kind of, like, feel that they deserve to be punished and stuff, right? But to the extent that we overcome that illusion, all of a sudden... That behavior is completely unreasonable. It doesn't make sense anymore because they're not, you know. Mm-hmm. So, so like, so that that's a way that basically we're like we're evolving to a, a higher state of, of evolution of civilization where we still compete for certain, you know, um, 
resources, but in a much, much more civilized way. It'd be a much better world. Cool. <laughs> all right. <laughs> so, like, all right. I mean, less pride and ar- pride, over pride and arrogance, less envy, less resentment, less animosity, less acrimony. I mean, the list goes on and on. Less suicide, no, less self hatred, less other hatred. You know, it's it's a much better world. More compassion. Yes. Yeah. With, with you do something wrong, it's you know. It's okay. And here's the thing, like right you now... You could not have done otherwise. Right. Now, 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 like, this is completely Which, which one are you up to now? You did number one, two, three... Number six, I think. I'm, oh, okay, number six. Yeah, we just can go over okay. this briefly that, like... You did very well with number one through five, I thought. Very good job, yeah. Yeah, thanks. We, we've got these drives. <laughs> we've got these... The pleasure drive, morality drive, reason drive. And what you've got to constantly keep in mind, it's not just one of them working, you know, at any decision. They're all working. Some may be, like, more in the foreground and the background. But, like, you know, if it's not the ple- pleasure pain, it's the morality. It's the reason. It's, the, you know... So, and... If, you, if, if, all are the, if all of these or even some of them are working on our every decision because they have to, and, you know, especially the pleasure pain one, obviously you can see how like you can't decide anything in a way that's free from this stuff. That's the point. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, we've got about six minutes left. Um, this is, this what is, does this mean? They work together on decisions. All the drives, well, one drive will be winning at any one moment one drive will will be the one i mean sometimes i go for pleasure sometimes i do what's right sometimes i do what's fair when i was in high school and like you said and younger i did the drive to procreate or be with a woman other times it's just all about survival like i said if i was on the titanic or you know some survival situation like a uh, concentration camp and I had to, you know, whatever, or so if I was a gladiator and I had to die, you know, the winner lives and the loser dies and I would have fight to the death. I mean, I would, you know, do that. So why does it keep switching depending on the situation? That's a good point. In other words, like, you know, at one point we might act a certain way because like we're led by one. It motivation. can change within your day. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And the thing is like, it's not up to us. You know, it's an this is like a value system, right? It's a value. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. It, it's kind of if you're always seeking to get pleasure and avoid pain, pain, you could be doing some immoral, unfair things that hurt your chances for procreation and survival. You could be doing drugs all day in isolation. So you're getting the pleasure. You're not doing what you feel is right. You don't think it's fair or reasonable. You have no desire to procreate because you're isolating doing drugs all day. And it's not good for your survival because you're, you're hurting your system, right? Your immune system, right? right? You're getting sick. You're smoking pot all day, whatever. But you're driving to see... But you love it. Right. You're getting a lot of pleasure. But if you start realizing that you're going to get lung cancer or something from smoking 50 cigarettes a day or whatever and 50 packs of uh, cigarettes and soda and cupcakes, your survival instinct, you're going to get you know out of shape and get sick, so your survival instinct, you have a lot of pleasure, but then you might realize as you get older, I want to live longer, so i got to cut all that stuff out. Exactly, and again, all these So it's all causal, still all causal. Right. Because as you get sick of going for pleasure all the time with the cigarettes and the pot and the alcohol and the cupcakes... Causally, when you get into pain, you'll want to change that to go to number five, survival instinct. So you realize all these drives are causal. Yes. Everything's causal. Oh, so. yeah. And, and also, when we're making these decisions, we kind of, we're not aware of all this kind of like, you know, this, what you're referring to, all these kinds of weighing one motivation against the other. But your drives can change. It's all causal. I mean, oh, yeah. Yeah. But, just, but you want people to be aware of what drive is in control at one at what time? No, no. The, the the idea is we can't be because this stuff is happening in our unconscious. Right, right. In other right. words, our you know all that we've learned is in our unconscious. Whenever we're making a decision, you know, and also that's a good point. You couldn't possibly think of all these things at one. You only have one thought at a time. So all of these competing drives are in your unconscious. Yes, yes. And, and all you know is I want to buy. I want to go to McDonald's. You know, I want to get a soda. That's all you're thinking. But meanwhile, you're getting the drive to seek pleasure. It's all in your unconscious. So you don't really know what's driving you. Right. And think about when this. When you stop and think about it, you could probably. But nobody does that. Oh, yeah. Mm. And so we've gotten these drives, right? It's not just about these drives. Because one thing we haven't gone through is, like, these drives are also competing with our emotions. Fear. Um, anger. Um, you know, we've got these emotions. In other words, we're trying to do what's right, okay? Then all of a sudden, we might be afraid. We might be afraid to do what's right. So that's it. And the thing about the emotions, like these drives, we can't decide what we're going to, like, 
what these emotions are going to be. They're going to hijack. If we're trying to be reasonable, right, and then all of a sudden we get all really emotional, you know, sometimes, like, if you're involved in some kind of, like, debate with someone or something, you know, your emotions kick in. The emotions, you know, are part of the decision. So, like, it's not just the drives. It's actually the emotions that aren't in our control. You're right about emotions. Anger and, not anger, fear and desire really control a lot of things here. Oh, yeah. All Especially right. fear. Yep. So I hope you we've got about two minutes left. I hope you're beginning to understand how because because these drives and these emotions are instinctual, they're hardwired, they're kind of like, you know, if it's a computer, it's kind of like the hardware of a computer, that that's the way we are. That's what we have to do. Take a second to show these, talk about how, you know, okay, absolutely. this free will thing being an illusion is getting more and more popular. Okay, Scientific American Mind, lands, landmark article, who's in control, how biology and uh, physics dictate your free will cover story. Okay, first time ever, this year, last year, New Scientist Magazine, a British weekly, free will, the illusion we can't live without. Okay, another landmark article. That, the thing about both of these... And all the books that are coming out, I mean, this topic is exploding onto the scene now. It We're is, We're just it a is. part of it. Yeah. We're leading the way, but we're just a part of it. Yeah. We're just a part of it. No, we are leading the way. Between <laughs> Anel and I both wrote books. Anel has his show in Manhattan. Do it Well, this is the show. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Wednesdays at 11 p.m. Sometime 50% live show, 50% we get this, you know, tape show. Uh, MNN 2, Wednesdays at 11. Okay, and then we've got this show every Thursday here in White Plains. We've got these shows that are on the internet. We've got our website. And also on MNN 2, this show will air. Right, the meetup. So basically, Anel and I are actually pioneering this new human... It's not that we're the first to come up with this. Yeah, right. Like the people before us, they just kept it in academia. That's they, correct. As a matter of fact, that this guy saw some Smolansky. He's like a philosopher. His view is like he understands free will is an illusion, but his, his view is that we shouldn't tell anybody. Why you know, is that? Because he's afraid that like if people believe that, understand they don't have free will, that they're, not, they're, they're just going to do whatever they want. They're not going to care. You know, so, and we've explained how people won't do that. That's the kind of People like with free theory. will will do that. Without free will, more exactly. order and sanity. All right, so again, we're, we're making history here. It's going to play out. Sam Harris This is the biggest thing the, ever. The biggest thing ever. Think about it. This Articles like, are coming out. Books are coming out. The Newer Testament. Dot, w, the Newer Testament dot net came out. The Newer Testament book came out. His book came out, Exploring the Illusion of Free Will. Thanks for watching. We've got eight seconds. <laughs> and again, this is the biggest thing ever. It's bigger than Einstein, Newton, Galileo, Darwin, Copernicus. See you next time.